Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Frank Z, and I'm uh, the uh, uh, moderator, uh, your host for this session, and I'm very happy to be here. Welcome to another session of Church Family Chats. This is the second in a series that uh, we are put in putting together this fall. Welcome to those who are here in person and to those who are following in, uh, us on live stream and YouTube. Thanks for allowing us into your house. This evening, we uh, welcome Dr. Hank Bestman, Professor of Biology and Biochemistry Emeritus at the King's University. His topic is From Genes to Organisms, Recent Discoveries in the Field of Biology. If you thought Darwin had it all cased, guess again. There has been an explosion of recent discoveries in the field of biology that is simply stunning. They point to the amazing diversity and complexity of God-created life as we know it. I asked Dr. Harry just, uh, just before if I should say, uh, how much I should say about him, and he said, very little. Very little, so he's a very modest person. But I'll share a few things with you. Dr. Hank Bestman, Emeritus Professor and Vice President of Academics and Research at the King's University College in Edmonton, Alberta. He studied agronomy in the Agriculture College in Drenthe. That's a good Dutch word, eh? A Dutch town. In the Netherlands in the 1970s, he received a BA in chemistry and biology at Dort College, Sioux Center, Iowa. He received his master's degrees in weed sciences at the University of Alberta in 1982, and his PhD in weed scientists at the University of Alberta in 1988. He's had an incredible amount of uh, work uh, in all kinds of capacities. Um, his academic uh, appointments, the most important part, was at the King's University as Professor of Biology and Biochemistry, and that was from 2006 to the year 2020. He's had lots of admi administrative appointments at the King's University. He was Vice President of Academics in 2015 to, to the year to, um, 2020. Yeah. And he was the Dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences in 2008 to 2011. And um, if you look at his full curriculum vitae, it's pages and pages long, so I won't say too much anymore. Um, and having said all that, and without further ado, we welcome you, Dr. Hank, uh, to give us this presentation. We look forward to uh, what you have to say to us. Thank you. Come on up. Thanks, Frank, for this uh, introduction. I'm glad you kept it short, because all these pages are pretty boring to read. <laughs> Although it was fun doing them together with my students, one of them being right there. And I welcome. I want to begin tonight on this topic on uh, complexity in biology. This was a brief historical introduction. I'm going to move quite rapidly through these. Um, this presentation has a dual purpose. It's going to be used next week at, at King's for lecture to students who might not know the beginning part, but these old folks here will probably was almost present there when it happened. So let's, um, let's, go be, let's begin. I'm going, to, I'm going to interrupt you for a minute. Oh, okay. Next slide, please. 1635 to 1703, Robert Hooke, who had this wonderful 
microscope here, as you can see, with a light. It was a lamp. Uh, under a microscope here, a compound microscope, he discovered that tissue, plant tissue, uh, had cells, individual little pockets, so to speak. Next slide. Anton van Leeuwenhoek, for those of you of Dutch descent, will now glow because he was a Dutchman who could, uh, was very good, at, um, very good at making lenses. And he was able to make a microscope. And he discovered bacteria and protozoa, small little organisms that we probably had not seen before. Next slide. Move on to Matthias Jacob Schleiden. The time moves on to from 1804 to 1881. He realized that all plants are composed of cells. You might know, we, we know that, we, that's known to us. But for them, it was quite something that the whole of plants were all made up of individual cells. And also that a new plant, an embryonic plant, arose from one of these cells. That's now how replication then, then would occur. Next slide. Theodore Swam, um, 1810-1882, looked mainly at animals. So there he noticed that also this cell theory, in other words, animals also consisted of individual, individual cells. Um, so the, the theory could be extended not only just to plants, but also to, to animals. And swan cells in the peripheral nervous system are named after him. Um, he also started to discover metabolism. Oh, you know, organisms are using, breaking down uh, chemicals, material that they have ingested. Next slide. Here we are at Walter Fleming. What's interesting about him is that, uh, first of all, he used dyes. So material that would color parts of, parts of the cell. So he could actually see nuclei and chromosomes. Chromosomes then will have, eventually see to that they have the genetic information in them. Uh, and because he could see, he could visualize things because of the dyes that he was using, it's the first biologist he was using these dyes, um, he could see the cell cycle. So he could see cell dividing. See that here, that's kind of illustrated there. He could divide. So the, you know, how cells would replicate because he could visualize the nuclei and the, uh, and the chromosomes due to the fact that he had the ability to stain, stain the cells, a, a process, of course, that's routinely being used nowadays. Next slide. Hugo von Mohl, uh, a botanist, he actually was the first person to observe cell division under the microscope using the green algae. I put him in because I love working with green algae. I spent most of my research on green algae, so I could not eliminate this slide. Um, he also suggested the word protoplast, which is basically the content within a cell. We call that together the protoplast. And he also uh, is, has gone on record as the first person who looked at the, the formation of bark and different types of bark that, have, that grow on, the, on a tree. Just as a quick rundown of the people then who have been instrumental in discovering in the early stages uh, about plants and animals. Next slide. Well, here we come to Gregor Johann Mendel, biologist, meteorologist, mathematician, Augustinian friar, abbot of St. Thomas Abbey and in Brno, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. Mendel, uh, you probably know that from high school still, worked with edible peas, looking at the inheritance pattern, okay, and discovered then the principles of, of inheritance, which formed the cornerstone of, of the modern genetics. So what we call Mendelian genetics, I'll show you in a minute what, what exactly he discovered. What's important here is this particular sentence here, that the, there is the inheritance is not just a blending of characteristics, but there are traits, the dominant traits and recessive traits. Dominant and recessive, and the 
are certain rules of inheritance, and he's known, he's known for that. He kind of wrote in obs obscurity. Um, his work was not much known, but later on you'll see people actually uh, rediscover these laws. Next slide. So, for example, in, in the case you have a pea plant, and you have pur one with purple flowers and white flowers, if you cross them, you get only purple flowers plants, or pea plants with purple flowers. Why? Because the purple, the purple flower is dominant, and the, the dominant you know, holds down the, the white, the recessive, the recessive one. So in the f this is the, these are the parents, the first generation that we call the F1 uh, has purple flowers. Now, if you take these, all these plants with purple flowers, you take there and you, you cross that, those two with each other, you end up then with the F2 generation, as we call that nowadays, second generation. And in that particular case, because this, this purple flower has a dominant and a recessive scene, but these, these genes will actually sp separate from each other during the uh, division process, and you end up with this situation that f you're going to have a three to one ratio. You have th you're going to have three of the plants going to be purple, and only one is going to be white. So these things are, uh, the, the one overrides the other, but because in the, one of the parents, this one here is a recessive one, a small p, they will, you know, if you have to have two of those come together, you end up with a PP, small p, and that is then a white, a white plant. So there are rules here, the rules of inheritance that were discovered. He's the first person who discovered that. And those who have taken genetics, uh, intragenetics, will have to go through this, and this can become very complicated if you start talking about can you work backwards, for example. Where is the, what does the parent look like if you start with the offspring? So that's the major work of Mendel, and that's really when, when we come to genetics, i.e. how we can you know, utilize these rules. Next slide. This is the original data from, uh, from Mendel. He did it with several things. He looked at flower color and seed color and seed shape. And these are all dominant, so the seed shape round is dominant, wrinkled is recessive, all of those. And if he did this whole process to the first generation, the second generation, and then looked at the distribution, you see it's all about 3, 3.15 to 1, 3 to 1, 2.96 to 1. So it's a 3 to 1 ratio that you get. So basically, like a, like a first mathematical interpretation of what happens in, in, in these crosses. Uh, that he is, he is known for, for that particular uh, aspect. Okay, let's... Next slide, please. Okay, here we come to the 1900s. It's very interesting that in the 1900s there were three scientists, uh, a Dutchman, Hugo de Vries, from um, Leiden University, Karl Korens, is a, a German uh, botanist, and Erang von Checkermark, Austria, all three of them, at about the same time, submitted a paper to the proceedings of the General German Botanical Society. And that's the, you know, they, they, all three of them was on kind of the same work as Mendel had done. And in many ways, they, they rediscovered Mendel's rules for inheritance is that you have this dominant over recessive, and then if you go to the second generation, you would have a three to one ratio. So that was, that was the first paper that was published on this particular understanding of, of Mendel's rule of inheritance. It's kind of interesting that it happened all at the, at the sa in the same year. Um, I don't know, I wasn't able to find out if these scientists were aware of Mendel's work or not. I doubt that they were aware of it. Uh, they just, on their own, um, figure this out. So you see that, you know, over time, because we go from the, from the early 1800s to about 100 years later, that we did, several individuals contributed to an understanding of how genetics then worked, mainly on plants. That's, you know, was a, 
easier, although it works on animals uh, too. So this is then hailed as the year 1900, and the, the 100 years following is hailed as the launching of the century of the, of the gene. So the century of the gene begins at 1900, because now we, we have understanding of what quote unquote genes, genes are. Next slide. Um, that term, central gene, is coined by um, Dr. Evan Fox Keller. She is a um, philosopher, historian of science, uh, biology in particular, and she has this book called The Century of the Gene. And most of what I have uh, used thus far comes from her book. She's written several other books. Um, one of them is on Barbara McClintock, which we'll come to later on. And the other book she's written has to do with you know, what, is, what is life, what makes up life, which is an, kind of an interesting book itself. Um, so it says, she plays also a major role in many ways. She's recent, she's still alive, um, in kind of writing the history and understanding of, of genetics. Next slide. William Bateson, uh, so around that time, uh, 1861 to 1926, um, he was the first person who actually started using the term genetics. Okay, genetics, and he was kind of the popularizer of Mendel's ideas. So he really took, took the information, the, what Mendel and the other three that had discovered, uh, in, an, in a book that he wrote in 1894, Materials for the Study of Variation, the first formulation of new approaches to genetics. So he's quite important in then spreading Mendel's and the other fellows' ideas around. So that's, he was the one actually that, that um, used the term genetics in a, in a publication. Next slide. Wilhelm Ludwig Johansen in 1857 to 1927. Well, that's not too long ago, 1927, only 100 years, a bit less. Um, is known for the constancy of the genome. In other words, the genome doesn't change over time unless the, a mutation happens. Right? He was the one who actually coined the term, the term gene. You, know, you might ask the question, why, why, is, it called, uh, why is it called gene? Uh, and he said that... Um, he found that to be the, the best word to use because it would not refer back to other terms that had been used and that were kind of dubious. Uh, um, Darwin had a term, gem, gemules he had, and he said that we gotta have some term, a new term that we can use. And that's, you know, he said gene, so then he had the word genotype, which is, you know, how the description of the genome, what's kind of inside, and phenotype, how it comes to expression. Right, so a plant has a phenotype if you look at it. It's the phenotype is you know, green leaves, red flowers. The genotype would then refer to how that, is, how that has come about, and to the internal. He was a Danish, a Danish fellow. Note you know, that most of this work is done in, in the um, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Germany, uh, Austria, Austria, and uh, in uh, you know, Denmark, yeah. That's where most of this discovery has happened. The uh, United States and you know, the, these continents here don't, uh, don't come into play yet. Okay, next slide. Now you might ask the question, what are genes? How must you envision you know, what, what a gene looks like? Right? So, and again, this, this is now from 1900 to 1953 period. That was the big question in that time. What, what is a gene? How must, how must we envision that? I mean, we, we, we never saw a gene. We just know that the, 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 um, the pea plant had a gene for a purple flower. We called it a gene, but we never really had seen a gene. Um, so, uh, so, is it just a... Nice apical world, or is there, word, or is there 
you know, is there a, what, what is a gene? What's the nature of that particular gene? Long discussion about that. Lots of you know, ideas about it. Is it some sort of a chemical molecule? Or you know, if it is, what sort of a molecule? Uh, is it protein? Protein had been discovered in this time. So is it a protein molecule that, uh, that triggers, that controls? Is it an aperiodic crystal or a solid? Very much some, you know, a, a, a physicist approach, crystals in different stages. Um, is it that? So that, that was the dominant, the dominant question in that particular time. Um, this, um, this chemical molecule was kind of interesting because in that time, if you look at the history of chemistry, there was a better understanding of the chemical structure and that you, know, you could change chemicals. So can something go from one state to another state? Is that also happening with a molecule in a cell that would do that, that would flip, for example? Right? If it, it's one form, if it's, it's recessive, it's another form if it, it's, uh, it's dominant. That would be one way of looking at it. Next slide. During that time also, I want to draw your attention to Barbara McClintock. This is the picture, this is the book. I took a picture of the book, Harry. Barbara McClintock was a geneticist uh, in, during this time. Um, a geneticist written about by Evelyn Fox Keller, a wonderful book to read. She was a little different, to say the least. Um, one of the first women geneticists. She worked on, worked on corn or maize, um, mainly with a microscope, looking at the inheritance, inheritance patterns of, um, of corn. She worked at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, which was in, that, in those years, in the middle of, well, not quite in 83, but before that, say in the 1950s, was kind of the hub of molecular biology, the beginning of molecular biology, mainly working with viruses, uh, so-called the phage group. She was working on corn. She's probably the only one who was working on corn. And she was studying, well, just the various colors that we have in the corn cob, in the, in the maize cob and you know, how that would change over time. And what she noted was that the, the colored kernel pattern was, was unstable. Now, it did not appear always the same in corn cobs. She grew it all corn herself. She, she had an intimate relationship with corn, right? Uh, so to speak, um, had a feeling for the organism. She just, corn was all she worked with. Um, she noticed that that pattern changed, and the colored kernel patterns were, and they were very unstable. Was, and she said, this is too unstable. This is too unstable to be considered a mutation. And a mutation would be when, when something changes internally. So maybe, you know, recessive, or, or from red, it goes to, to, to yellow, the color. She says, that this, is, this, this is not a mutation. There's some, something else is going on here. This is laborious work, and she spent years and years on this um, without much funding. Uh, but she was a very persistent lady. Um, not easy to get along with either if you read a book. Okay. And she coined the term jumping genes. So now at this point, you know, we have sorry, some idea of a gene, and here's kind of, you know, kind of a little, shown as a little diagram. But what happens, as you see, if this is, there are two genes, right, and they, in the, in the division process, as a new, a new, um, new cell forms, they could just be inherited independently, not, not crossing over. But if they cross over here, you see, if you go from here, then see, no, no, if this one would break and that one would break, and you would connect this one 
with this part here, and that one will be connected with that part here, you end up with different genes. Look at this one here. This one is different, right, than this one. The top is the same, but the bottom is different because it had the bottom of that part. Jumping genes, jumping genes are called. There's a crossing over, because he's the first one to detect that. The molecular biologist, well, we had him already in, in those days. Um, the molecular, um, well, see, also 1992, 1992, but in the 1950s, you would have molecular biologist already. They laughed at her, literally. They didn't believe her whatsoever. Genes don't jump. Well, they were put to shame because later on we indeed discovered that she was dead on genes. In that sense, they, they jump, quote, unquote, jump, they cross over, and you make a new linkage. So you link, as I said, part of this one here, see the bottom part here is now here, and the top part is still there, but we got the bottom part from the other gene. And that, that will change then the pattern of the color, if the genes are the genes for color, in the, in the corn cob. This is you know, meticulous work, all done by hand in a little microscope. Um, she so didn't need much money for, as a grant money to do the, work, the research. As I said, she was laughed at. Um, she was invited to give a talk at the, um, at the group that was uh, more the molecular one and kind of laughed at, although she persisted. Um, in 1983, she won the Nobel Prize in Physiology, finally. She's the only woman, single woman, who holds a Nobel Prize. There are more women who've had Nobel Prizes, but they were always joined with someone else. Um, fascinating book to read. Um, so that's Barbara McClintock, as we call a cytogeneticist. Okay, next slide, please. This is a key experiment. It shows a key experiment that was done, um, done to, to determine what? Well, to determine if the gene is a protein or a nucleic acid. Simple as that, that's the only question. Because at this time, we had it, we knew about proteins. Someone else also had isolated DNA, the oxyribonucleic acid. Uh, it, is, is it one or the other, right? So this is a key experiment, the so-called Avery, uh, Avery McLeod experiment. Now, it was done with, with mice. And the mice, you can infect them with, an, uh, with the bacterium. Uh, so there was a, what they call a rough strain of bacterium. Um, it was non-violent. You inject it into the mouse, and there's no problem. The mouse goes happily ever on. No problem. It kept on living. There was a smooth strain of the same bacterium, what they call a virulent one. You inject it into the mouse, belly up. Mouse dies. OK, so there's something. There is something in this smooth strain that makes the mouse die, right? So and that is either we were, we were focusing on DNA or um, um, protein, a protein. Then they took this, the, um, this smooth strain, heat killed the smooth strain, in other words, just took this bacterium and just basically put in boiling water, probably, and injected it, and the mouse just lives just fine. In this case here, they took the, the rough strain and the heat-killed smooth strain, and sure enough, the mouse, the mouse dies. Now, when you heat-kill, an organism like a, a, a bacterium, you basically destroy the protein that comes apart. So there's no, no, in this case here, there's a smooth strain. That, that protein is not active, but the mouse got killed. So it must be the DNA. 
This is hailed as the experiment that basically launched us into searching for what exactly does DNA does do? What's the structure exactly? Um, the, the Avery, there's another experiment too yet yeah, that, that is done after this, but in a more complicated way, um, but that gave the same results. So the, the DNA, the oxyribonucleic acid, is the, is the, was the established in this case that it was the, the carrier, the carrier of the, of the gene. It is, it is somehow involved in, in genetics. It's not the protein. That was quite a battle in those days, because in proteins, you know, we, we started to discover proteins, we started to discover the structure of proteins, et cetera, et cetera. So this was a major, major point. Next slide. So as I said, the 1943 Avery McLeod experiment, uh, DNA is the carrier of biological specificity uh, in bacteria. So it's, you know, the carrier of, of, of uh, the Oh, gene. At that time, also, there was you know, one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, because the gene does produce, be involved in making, making uh, proteins, making enzymes, and it's only one, one type. So it's very, one gene does one particular thing, nothing else. So that was you know, about 1943, and then we come to 1953, that's the, the structure of DNA by Watson, Craig, and Rosalind Franklin. Next slide. So this is the structure of DNA. You probably have all seen that. Um, this is what we call an X-ray diffraction pattern of DNA. So this is Watson and Craig working in England uh, at Cambridge. Uh, I think Harry and I were in the lab one time, weren't we, Harry, when we were in Cambridge? It's kind of a strange feeling and, and interesting to visit the lab where they discovered the uh, structure of DNA. It was done with X-ray diffraction. So you extract, you extract DNA and you, uh, you purify that. And then with the X-ray, it gives this kind of a pattern. And this is called photo 51. They took many pictures of that. I mean, that's how the output comes from it. Um, actually, the fraction pattern, and this is 51 was the best picture. And that, on, on the basis of that, those who are X-ray diffraction pattern experts, then predicted a structure, the structure of DNA. And here you see that right, this this right, this this twist, the, 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 the molecule and the one running the other way and then these bases that go across. We'll come to in a minute exactly here. And here we have it in molecular structure. If you do it on PowerPoint, it actually turns around for you, but I guess in the system you use here, it doesn't, doesn't quite work. So that's, just, that's the structure of DNA, right? And my tie has it too, just in case you don't believe me. It's, uh, I got that from my students once upon a time. Okay, um, next slide. I don't want to just say, well, yeah, Watson and Craig structured DNA, let's move on. It's not, you know, I, it's, they weren't the only ones, and we often, we often forget about that. So, sure, Watson and Craig, James Watson and Francis Craig, received, together with Maurice, uh, Maurice um, Wilkins, who was, was a biophysicist, these three received the Nobel Prize for this particular discovery. He, did all, he was the, the, the actually diffraction person who actually did the work were these two people. Rosalind Franklin, actually crystallographer, um, who together with Raymond Gosling, and he actually took the picture. I, I just discovered that, I didn't know that I thought he took the picture. No, he actually took the picture and went on to have a career as, an, uh, as a physicist uh, in England. They, they together the picture, they interpret the picture, although she already, she was so excited about it, she showed it to them and said, hey, this is probably the structure of DNA. So that was in, in 1953. So often you hear people say, well, Watson and Craig discovered DNA. No, no, Watson and Craig discovered, you know, were involved in the structure of DNA. 
because DNA was already isolated a long time before that. You know. uh, but then, well, between 1844 and 1895, uh, Mischer in Germany was the first one to isolate DNA. So they didn't isolate it. This, this one uh, person isolated the, 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 the uh, DNA and developed a procedure for that. Erwin Chargaff is an interesting person because he predicted, okay, when he saw the, uh, the structure of, of what the isolated DNA, he suggested that the bases, the ones that connect, and showed in a minute better on the slide, that the two bases that connect in between those strands, you know, across, you know, on my, on my T, on, on my uh, tie here, those, they are a one-to-one -one ratio. Because there's, there's two bases that come together, two different ones that come together and bind to each other. That was already predicted by him. As I said, these two got the Nobel Prize. They did all the work, the, the physical work, so to speak. Um, you know, in many ways, maybe the next slide. Yeah, they, DNA is a bit of a boring molecule. I, I used to say it in class all the time. Remember Anna? It's boring. <laughs> it's a boring molecule in many ways. You know, it's this long strand, right? And there's another one goes this way. But well, they run, they run anti-parallel. There's, there's a one end, a three prime end, and a five prime end. We call that. And the one is from three to five, and the other runs from five to three. Um, but the bases, this is the one that connect them. These bridges, like a, like a winding staircase, right? The bases are, and they link adenine and thymine, A and T, they link each other, and guanine and cytosine, they link each other. They form then those bridges across. And that was this one-to-one -one ratio, one guanine with one cytosine, that was predicted by Char Chargaff already, before Watson and Crick. Uh, so that's the, and then this backbone, this one and this one here, these backbones, they are phosphate, sugar phosphate bas uh, backbone. So it's a, it's a sugar and a phosphate molecule. We won't worry too much about the detail of the structure. Um, so a base pair and then the, the backbone. And the, these base pairs are, the, these bases are, uh, contain nitrogen. Next slide. Okay, so, so we have this DNA, right? What does it do, right? What, what, what is the genetic message? How does that come to, come to expression? Well, it is, it is two strands wrapped around each other. During the uh, replication process, this unwinds, okay? It unwinds. And there are two strands we call a leading strand, and the <coughs> and this other the lagging lagging strand. So you see, we, we, we this is sep can separate from each other, right? You, you see it here. It's pulled apart, and this moves this way. There's a there's an enzyme here called the helicase that that kind of pulls it apart and unwinds it, right? And as this, so now you have this only one base sitting here, one of those, you know, half of, of these cross links, and the other half sits here. Then there are these enzymes, and these are protein molecules. Here, this is a DNA polymerase, and it moves along and puts new bases, which are made in, in the biochemical pathway, and links them together. See, so here, you see only you know, one base, and then the new one is added to it. And this moves along. And it, this, before that, it unwraps, and at the end here, it, 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 it wraps again. Uh, so that's what we call the replication fork. It opens up, uh, and yeah. I think that, Where are they made? Oh, they're, they're just made by... Yes, there, there's a whole bi biochemical pathway that makes these bases. Yeah. OK, 
Okay, so this is the original template. Here you get the new one. So from one DNA molecule, you get, you're going to get two. So you replicate it. All right? And hopefully no, no, mistakes is ma no mistakes are made. Uh, hold, cross your fingers. Um, let me see here. Next slide. Okay, now that is how you how you make make the uh, DNA how DNA um, makes it new a new strand. What happens is also is that if you have this uh, a single strand, you can with an RNA polymerase, it is transcribed. What that means is that the the genetic information here. Right, in the DNA, which is basically the, the letters, right, different bases that we have, who are attached to this sugar phosphate backbone. The RNA polymerase is again a large enzyme, and it then transcribes that, and it makes, it makes this here, which would be uh, would be an, uh, an R, this is DNA, this would be RNA. This would be an RNA molecule. Notice it's, you know, it's a different, well, it's also a bit of a, it's also a backbone you have there with these bases attached to it, right? So what here was an A, a U, is in this one now, and a G is a C connect, and a T and an A, and this is kind of, this, this kind of this football, kind of moves along and makes then the, an RNA molecule. We call this an RNA polymerase. Again, that's a large enzyme complex that does that. <clears throat> the RNA and RNA polymerase. Now, this RNA polymerase, these um, Okay, next slide. Now, that, that, that strand, that new strand that was made against the strand from the DNA, that new strand uh, <clears throat> would be called a messenger RNA. And what happens it is it goes to a, another complex called the ribosome, a large protein. Proteins are the workhorses in cells. That's why they're a lot more interesting in DNA. DNA is kind of it's a boring static thing in many ways. Proteins are very interesting molecules. What happens is that this messenger RNA, which is a new strand that was made against the, was transcribed from the DNA, that now you have these bases again. There is a tRNA molecule. Sorry about all the RNAs and DNAs, but that's just the way it is. Uh, this particular tRNA transfer RNA, this picks up an amino acid. Okay, those proteins are, are basically long chains of amino acids, all linked together by polypeptide bonds. So the tRNA molecule brings an amino acid, and this tRNA molecule recognizes, well, some recognize, you know, the, 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 uh, the blue one, some the yellow one, some the orange one, etc., etc. So there's a whole series of these tRNA molecules that recognize the various bases that we have. Fairly complex, as you can well imagine. And they, they link that here. So here's now is one that comes together. This one is that's here, and then these will be linked together, and what comes off here, here is a chain of amino acids linked together. So the, the sequence of these, right, is the result, and they're, they're different from each other. Well, some are the same, because you have to have two, two of the same, well, these around, like the yellow ones or the, or the, or the, uh, the blue ones. They link together, and this is then what we call an, an amino acid chain. Okay, amino acid chain. So the, the sequence of the, of, the, of the amino acids, and there's a whole series of amino acids, different types of amino acids, 
uh, different structure. They are made, and they come off the ribosome. So from this messenger RNA, we make then this particular strand of amino acids. And that, that folds up automatically into a protein. That what, that, 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 the, the, because of their various, because of the sequence of the type of amino acid it is, it'll fold into a particular protein molecule. And there are hundreds of different protein molecules. And they can be either enzymes that catalyze reactions, or they can be, um, they can just be a, a protein that's stored for energy or, or any other thing, right? So whatever proteins do. May, most of them are enzymes. Uh, and there are various different types of enzymes that we have. But the enzymes catalyze your metabolic reactions. So that's the, the rather complicated story that we have with, in this, we make, how we make the, um, we make protein from, from DNA. Next slide. Here you see it in a maybe an easier format. So you have the DNA here, right? Two strands, different bases attached to it. T and A link up, or A and T, C and G. Uh, that is transcribed into an RNA molecule, right? And that then is translated into a polypeptide, which is becomes a protein. It's a different polypeptide is just a link or a chain of amino acids that then folds up into a structure that will catalyze a reaction, uh, for example. Just as an aside, Jack? Um, I, I don't know the exact time for, on this, Jack. I didn't check that out, but it's pretty, it's pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. Like five, no, we, we, we a bit longer, but not much. Not much. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how, we, how we get to protein. And that's, you say, well, how is that genetic? How is this genetic information? Well, because the, the protein that is produced has a particular function. One might be you know, to, to combine two, uh, two hydrocarbons together to make some kind of a compound. Another one might be involved in, in other processes. I'll, and I'll show you later on a metabolic pathway, uh, all the various, various uh, reactions that occur in the body. They are all catalyzed by proteins, and there are different proteins we make. They're all different. I mean, there's hundreds of different proteins. As an aside, as I was saying, the making this, this folding, as I showed before, it folds up into a structure. Just recently, I mean, probably about a year ago, we have finalized the, or have this, how shall I put it? There is, a chem, there is now, a, 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 an, um, on the internet available, a computer program that based on what type of amino acids there are in sequence, fold it up for you. You can show that. So if you, if you give me a, you know, a certain sequence of, of amino acids, depending on what, it, what gene it was, it will show what kind of protein it folds. Uh, fascinating uh, process. Next slide. Here you see it in, 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 put together. What we have here is, you know, this is the cell, right? Here would have this whole process of transcription occurring right here, all right? The messenger RNA is made, it exits the, the cell, comes into the cytoplasm. So this is the nucleus, cytoplasm, and there it is translated on the ribosome into a, 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 a protein, right? That then has some function within the cell that catalyzes the reaction. That's probably the best way of putting it. Next slide. I just want to, sh want to show you just a, a metabolic pathway. Um, 
So, you know, a metabolic pathway is where you know, molecules change. And they're usually carbon-based, so a compound like malate, which has four, four carbon atoms in it, and probably some side chains, but that doesn't rele it's not relevant right now. Malate becomes oxaloacetate. And what's, what's present here is, is an enzyme. Right? And so oxaloacetate uh, will convert to citrate eventually via acetyl-CoA. And again, you see a change in the number, number of carbon atoms, and there are also side chains to that yet, not shown on this diagram. So this is a, a typical metabolic pathway. This happens to be called the citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle, my favorite uh, biochemical pathway. Um, anyway, so that's, that's how then the gene expression, right, how the gene expresses itself in the uh, function of the proteins what proteins are being made. So the, you know, proteins are important, and I think they're, they're actually more interesting than DNA is. DNA is kind of straight, boring, forward. But proteins, there are hundreds and hundreds of different uh, proteins. Next slide. Stability, genetic stability. Um, DNA is not intrinsically very stable. It is estimated that there are one out of every 100 bases are copied erroneously. One out of every 100 bases are copied uh, erroneously. A repair system is present. Um, the repair system is uh, involved in forestalling or for preventing uh, mistakes and copying or uh, repair copying mistakes. So, one in every hundred is wrong. In total, the system that we have, the frequency of mistakes is only one in 10 billion. Let us think in for a moment, right? One of a hundred is wrong. We end up with a system where one in 10 billion is wrong. So this repair system does a good job. They're not on the job sleeping. Next slide. Francis Collins. Evangelical Christian, American physician, syngenticist, person who discovered uh, the genes associated with a number of diseases, one of them being cystic fibrosis. He is the person who led the Human Genome Project. Um, I would love to get Francis Collins to come to Edmonton sometime and give a talk. Uh, Harry and I know Francis well, and he's just an amazing scientist. Um, um, a wonderful Christian. He was an atheist and became a Christian. His book, The Language of Life, is worth reading, um, where he basically says, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a scientist and also believing in God. These two are not uh, against each other. They can go together very well, matter of fact. Thank you. Um, he is um, uh, well known. Uh, he was the, um, um, he led the Human Genome Project, which is next on my slides. Um, he was the, the director of the National Institute of Health. He also just recently oversaw the COVID-19 development in, in the U.S and he is currently on the cabinet of uh, President Biden as the acting science advisor to the president. Uh, Harry and I think he's going to win the Nobel Prize, but he didn't do it this year yet, so. Anyway, Francis Collins then is uh, head of the, the Human Genome Project. So let's go to the Human Genome uh, Project. People start talking about Okay, so now we have an idea, because we know how the DNA works and how the cell works. We should, you know, we should sequence the human genome. Right? Let's, let's know the whole range of, of nucleotides that we have, a whole, all the genes. Um, this you know, was already talked about in the 70s, um, because Frederick Sanger developed a technique for sequencing the DNA, who won his second Nobel Prize, uh, but that's beside the point. Uh, it became an international research effort to de sequence the whole entire human genome. Um, goal to understand the function of it, of course. Um, the cost was um, 
3 billion US and about 300 million yet. There were two groups basically involved, the Department of Energy and NIH in the US and a private company by Craig Venter. In the end, they came together on it. They did a sequencing project. Massive, massive uh, project, international, involved many labs across the world. Francis Collins was the one who basically organized all that and kept everybody on track. Um, now, I want you to remember, though, we haven't said much about size yet. How large is the size? If a human has about, um, in, in humans, to have about 1.13 billion nucleotides total, every human being has. Um, only about 20,000 of, 20, of those uh, actually produce proteins. So the question is, what does the, what does the rest do? I mean, from having 1.13 billion to 20,000, that's quite a, you know, <laughs> there's quite a loss in between that, so to speak. 20,000, they produce proteins. What happened to the other ones? Add to that, this all happens within a cell, right? And a cell is only one micro, uh, micrometer, or point one, 0 0.001 millimeter. It's a hundred of a millimeter. So all this is happening in a space so tiny. You know, we talked last year, we had Ryan Martin talk about the, the light years, and we were all impressed with the distances and, you know, light takes so long to get here. I hope you're impressed by the smallness here too, what happens. Um, okay, let's move on here. So time is going on. I'm having too much fun. Um, okay, now the, well, I think I, did we miss a slide here? No. Okay, well, this is, if you go to the Human Genome Project, you see here the, um, you know, the timeline of it, right? And it finished in, 2000, in 2003. We did more than just the human genome, okay? We did also the, uh, the mouse was done, uh, the rat was done, some microorganisms were done, some bacteria were done. Um, why those? Well, because these are typical examples of, of, of animals that, um, that are used in experimental work in trying to understand and research. Um, not many plants were done yet. Why is that? Because the plant genome is a lot more complex, a um, lot larger than the human genome. Uh, it's massive, a plant, plant genome. So we're, we're getting to the plants eventually. We have gotten to it, but it's not. It took a bit longer. And there is no plant genome project. It's individual labs that are doing that. Okay. Um, Let's move on, next slide. So the results of the Human uh, Genome Project then, we have the precise order of the nucleotides in the human genes. Uh, we have uh, rapid DNA sequencing methods. You know, when we started that process, when they started that process, I wasn't there yet, um, we knew how to do it, but it was very slow. It would take 40, 50 years and that, that, using that method. It was very manual. So Collins recruited a lot of engineers to make equipment to have this faster. Now we can, the latest I read was that we can do a human genome in about a day uh, total, uh, which is quite surprising. Um, so rapid sequencing methods between 20,000 and 40,000 genes in, the, in human cells. It's all in the gene bank database. You can upload it, you can download it, you can take a look at it. Um, so we had mouse, rat, E. coli. Uh, little worms, the elegans. These are, these are typical organisms that bi you know, biologists use to, to, to investigate, easy to work with. Um, if, you're, if you want to look at these, um, the database, do it before you want to go to sleep, because it's really boring. Because all of this is letters. Adenine, <laughs> thymine, all these various bases. That's all, the sequence of bases. That is, that is the message, right? It's, it's just a, yeah, you can look at the book, it's great, but you don't know what it means, right? You can't read it. 
Okay. Um, it's you know, it was the major science project that, that we, we have accomplished. Um, next slide. If you read Francis Collins' textbook or his book, um, then he, he was, this was written while we were doing the Human Genome uh, Project. Um, and he is quite optimistic in the sense that once we have the genome, then we can use that information to start looking at, uh, at uh, diseases, right? Um, but this, this, is what is, this comes from an, uh, an article that I read in the Scientific American uh, where Colin said, hmm, I was pretty optimistic. You have to be if you want to start a project, right? Uh, but it turned out to be more elaborate than we might have guessed. A lot more complicated than we had anticipated, basically. Um, it doesn't mean that it, that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't worth doing. It just means that this, this is only the first stage. Um, and I, this is his quote here. This is because of the fabulous complexity of the pathways from genes to the sorts of common diseases, like diabetes, that make people more vulnerable to a virus. He was talking about the, the, the COVID virus and the, uh, how diabetes interacts with that. And we don't know much about diabetes, how we can genetically do that. So it, that was his, kind of his frustration. So, you know, the, the conclusion was that the, the Human Genome Project by itself has not been able to offer the sort of health benefits that geneticists envisioned 30 years ago. Okay. Was it a waste? I don't think so. But that's, that's, I was quite, quite pleased with finding this quote from Francis. At least you don't have to believe me. You can believe him. Uh, he's probably more reliable than I am. Um, so, next slide, please. Okay, the, the Human Genome Project, we discovered that the majority of the human genome does not encode proteins. And it's the proteins that control things, that, that, that do the reactions. Uh, many of these genes, or these, you know, the, these nucleotides, as we have all nice lined up, they don't code, they don't give, give rise to new, new protein. It's just not, not part of their role, so to speak. Uh, we have uh, non-coding regions, and they have what they call regulatory sequences that control gene expression. So in other words, you might have a couple you know, uh, nucleotides that are translated, produce a protein here, but the next whole run beside it, they don't, they don't produce protein at all. They somehow, and the emphasis is on somehow, control, they regulate somehow. And don't ask me how, because we don't know yet. They, they do regulate. That seems to be, you know, there's some you can figure out, but how does that exactly accomplished? There is no full-blown theory yet. Not at all. Um, so genes that control expression, there are so-called enhancers that activate gene expression. You know, hey, hurry up, get this done, so to speak. Right? And then there are also silencers who say, hey, you shut up. Don't, don't we turn them off? So there seems to be built in that sequence, not only making proteins, right, that, that regulate metabolism, et cetera, et cetera, but there seems to be in, built into that a, regu a regulatory system right within the sequence of nucleotides. That, so that's, and that is not something that we were anticipated, that they were anticipated, not at all. You know, we have, we have enhancers and we have silencers, right? So, so, next slide. Well, scientists who have finished sequencing the human genome, they have to do something. No, they, can't, they have to they go back and go on POE, so to speak. No, they have to do something else. So what happened was a new project was started, the ENCODE project. 2003, it's basically step two. It's again international uh, affair consortium, not as, uh, not as strongly related, related to NIH, National Institute of Health, um, but it's a consortium of 400 scientists in 32 labs across the world, you know, US, UK, Spain, Singapore, et cetera. And they are asking the question, you know, what are the functional bits? What do they do? They start to answer the question. Okay, so this part does, 
makes proteins or codes for proteins, but this part here, what does it do? What does this particular gene do? Um, as I already said, it's 1% of the human genome codes for protein. Uh, there are 70,000 sequences on the human genome that codes for promoter regions. Uh, this is where proteins bind to control gene expression. So that's a region, meaning the mean where these nucleotides are. Something can bind to that, and that seems to affect the expression of another gene. This gets very com complex, as you soon gather. There are four, 400,000 enhancer regions which regulate distant genes, you know, like not just right beside me, not I don't control my neighbor necessarily, it might be something way down. How that works, we don't know yet. It's not clear. There are uh, four million gene switches. They turn genes on or off. Again, the question is, what controls that? Right, do they just, you know, randomly go about, or is there, are there signals? 80% has a definite biochemical function. So, you know, if you want to talk about evolution, which means things are changing, right, that the an organism evolves over time, it might not make a certain protein anymore, or some other growth happens on it, or whatever, right? Um, evolution is caused both by change in the genes, which code for proteins, which we always thought, oh yeah, there's a, there's a, different, pro, a different gene here. But it can also be that the code that has regulatory control. So this is getting fairly complex, as you probably have gathered. Next slide. E. coli, a little bacterium, is only five microns in, in length. If this is five microns, well, this is only a bit less than a micron. Very tiny, very tiny organism, right? A great experimental uh, bacterium to work with. Next slide. That's the latest. It's the latest and the greatest. It's not quite right from E. coli. I couldn't find an E. coli one, but it's from another uh, marine organism. And this is how we start now looking at the genome. What you see here, the red and the blue, that is the DNA molecule, right? The two strands, one, you, can, you read them opposite always. All these coming off here, right, are, well, they are the individual nucleotides. And there are blue ones, and there are red ones, and they all have a different function. Uh, I did not dig too deep into this, that's exactly the difference between blue and, blue and red, but some, only a small number of these, are involved in making proteins. The rest is in a control function. This is just, the organism that I'm talking about here is almost the same size as the E. coli. All this, right, these, and all these regulatory things are all present in this small little organism. We're not talking about an organism that's, you know, is a light year long. <laughs> We're talking about five mi micron or something like that, or even a human cell. It's just, so the complexity is astounding, uh, to say the least. But they seem to be making some progress on this, uh, on the NDN Encode project, which is basically the, the hot project at the moment, to really, you know, the step beyond the human, human genome project. Next slide. Here's a close-up of it. Uh, like I said, I am not familiar yet with ex what exactly these, these codes mean. Um, well, this is this is what we you know what we are currently, as a, as a biology scientific community, are looking at. What what controls this? The implications of this, um, we can talk about more in the question period. Um, that's probably good. I do. I do hope that I've given you a bit of an overview of what has happened in biology. You know I. I can't help when I, when I spent quite a few weeks on this. Uh, it's kind of my hobby at the moment. What else are you going to do when you're retired? You've got to have something. Uh, <laughs> um, and there's more going on in biology uh, beyond this, this particular uh, 
works. But I can't help, the more I read this and, and, and think about it, I'm always then reminded of Job 38 and 39. And God questions, you know, how were you there? And all, all, all that whole framework. And I should one of these just translate that in, in, in genomic language. You know, were you there when, when I designed these, these, these uh, control genes? Were you there when, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I marvel and stand a bit astounded and almost you know, become quiet to realize the complexity uh, of the creation and that it is sustained by the word of God. I think that's just, that just blows me away. Thank you. You can stay up here. I will. To see something like this in, a, in the presentation that you have given us just is so astounding, so astounding. Now, one of the first things that really grabbed me was uh, uh, Dr. Hank used a timeline. He started back in the 1800s. And you know what? My grandfather was born in the 1800s. That really, I thought, my goodness, that's not very long ago. And... Um, it was the late 1800s, but it was the 1800s. Um, I don't know if I can say I learned a lot, but I certainly saw a lot. And so I'm sure that there's people out here that are much better at chemistry and all of this stuff than I am. So we will open it up for uh, uh, questions just for, uh, for a little while, and we'll see where it goes. So anyone who has... Uh, a question that they would like to um, put forward. Uh, raise your hand and I'll run over to you and uh, give you the mic. Bob is first. Thank you. Dr. Hank, I was fascinated by one of your very last statements <clears throat> where, where you observe that evolution doesn't only affect genetic expression, but also the regulatory system. So if that's true, that means that revolution can move much more quickly, right? Because when you're looking at the messing with the internal whole structure of something, it can move much more rapidly and quickly. So often you get the line of people who want to just poo-poo Evolution as saying that, well, there hasn't been enough time for it to happen. But if it indeed also affects that regulatory function of DNA, then it could happen really quick, couldn't yes. it? Yes, it could. I haven't you know, gone that route that far yet, but I, I, um, we have observed in other research, uh, I'm thinking of my, my pathway into systems biology, where indeed that, that, that is being done, and there, you know, we can almost, um, I mean, that's a whole other area where, we, where mathematics comes into, into biology, uh, which we should save for another year, because I'm not quite up to seven now yet, but um, where we can almost predict where an evolution, well, if we do this, if this happens here, this will happen to the organism. So, yeah. Uh, my concern, as I said, my concern with, you know, this, this is wonderful knowledge that we have, how are we going to use this? That's the overhang. Uh, I think there is also within the, within the research world, uh, especially in the, the um, molecular biology, biochemistry, genetics area, there is a great concern there too. How do we use this information, right? And, and who, who has access to it? If it's that simple, quote unquote, um, Luckily, you know, there is, and then we get into the whole area of what we call synthetic, bio, synthetic biology. Uh, can we make our own organisms? Well, I don't want to speak to that yet. Right, say, right now, I would say, no, let's not even go there. But. 
Jack? Could I, just, just a follow-up question. Would, would um, the, the variants in, in, in COVID-19 be uh, an example of that? Um, I don't want to address that. You know, uh, I don't know if it's an example of it. I mean, there is the Omicron virus uh, chain. They, they, are, they are mutating, but I think that's just a quote-unquote regular mutation that's happening. I don't think it's the, you know, the regulatory one, at least not what I've read, but then I ha I'm not an expert on COVID-19 variant. I, I gave some lectures on the, <clears throat> on the earlier first form, how it actually gets into the cell. And, um, you know, you, we all don't like the COVID virus, but if you look at this at the biochemical level, how this little thing gets into the lung cell and replicates because it has the whole the same mechanism as, as I've shown you here, uh, it happens. Matter of fact, it brings its own mechanism along as it enters the cell. It's a fascinating little thing. So it's, yeah, we all hate it, but it's a beautiful chemistry and biology. Anyway. Hank, <laughs> the... Um uh, I wonder quite a bit about the big jumps in evolutionary history. So from, from uh, the small mice that survived the, uh, uh, the, the big asteroid explosion 66 million years ago or so, and the small mammals that supposedly survived, and how those small mammals developed, you know, into woolly mammoths and, uh, and uh, uh, human beings and whales and mosquitoes, while well, mosquitoes maybe survived the uh, thing. So that, and I presume that all has to come out of that regulatory function of, 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 the, of, of that whole DNA sequence, right? That, that those would make changes. That would make some sense, Jack, but I, I'm hesitant to speak too authoritarian, uh, authoritative on that one. Okay, I'm, this is my discovery in the last three, four months. Okay, you will have to wait maybe another year. But I, I, I think it makes, makes some sense because that, that has a potential to cause a more rapid uh, evolution, change in organism, more adaptable. But, yeah. Well, Hank, regarding the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, your concluding comments about the rapid movement of evolution, uh, I uh, don't recall now the name of the person who won the Nobel Prize, but uh, I wonder if you could comment on that his research with uh, very early humanity and connecting two eras. I, I don't know whether you, you perhaps you followed that more closely. Than I have I not had a chance. I've been busy with this particular presentation. But it, uh, it, speaks, uh, it speaks to the changing uh, evolutionary processes. So. I'm yeah, just I, I've seen it, who, who won it, but I haven't dug into it yet. Uh, Jim, sorry, I'm not, I ran out of time today. Uh, a number of years ago when they were working on the Human Genome Project, uh, there was also a side bend to that. Uh, companies like Monsanto and other ones that were trying to patent uh, genetic modifications. I, I haven't heard anything about that lately. Uh, how has that gone in the last while? I can't speak to that, to be honest. I, I know that, that that was going on, but I haven't followed that particular part uh, that much. Um, no, that has not been my, my focus at the moment. My focus has more been on trying to understand the science here. Um, I have serious questions about these kind of things, you know, in terms of... Uh, patenting and stuff. That does not sit well with me. Um, but I haven't, I haven't fallen in great detail. I, I, you know, when I retired, I started looking at systems biology, uh, the more mathematical approach, and then I ended up looking at this particular part because I, I then discovered the ENCODE project. I said, oh, and I was reading Francis Collins, uh, rereading him, and I, then I happened to come across this, this paper where he says, you know, I, Hmm, it's not as good as I hoped, so to speak. Um, as a matter of fact, I also heard him, at a con I heard him at a conference this summer via Zoom that he had some, well, not doubts, but saying, yeah, this, we were all pretty optimistic, um, but hmm, it is more complex. Uh, so the, the complexity aspects started to um, 
intrigue me more. So, thank you for uh, being here. Thank you, Dr. Hank, for your presentation, for sharing your knowledge and, and all those wonderful slides. It was just wonderful. And a special thanks to our, uh, our techies back there. Uh, without you, this session wouldn't be going out or we wouldn't be able to enjoy listening to one another. Now, our next session, um, We'll be on Tuesday evening, October the 18th at 7 o'clock in the Inglewood CRC. Inglewood's pastor, Reverend Andrew Akuma, will help us think through the Protestant Reformation, whether to celebrate it or to grieve it. Reverend Andrew will help us to take a critical look at some of the causes of the Protestant Reformation examine its key outcomes, and mull over some of the gains and losses from the Reformation that Christ's body has experienced over the past um, 500 years. So you're invited to join us, and thanks again for your participation and evening. May God bless. Thank you.